spring bill gull. Um, if you notice, he actually has a hook attached to his beak in a couple of spots. And that's usually because people, especially fishermen, they sometimes have to cut the lines of their fishing rod or their fishing line um, because it gets snagged or stuck. And unfortunately, because of that, some birds actually think those lures are food and will try to eat them. Um, here we have a red-tailed hawk. You notice that he has a cast on his leg. So sometimes they come in. This one had a fracture, so it's kind of like a broken bone, but not really. Um, just a little crack, basically, is what happened to him. Sometimes birds come to us sick. So especially when there's pesticides and um, other environmentally harmful chemicals um, can cause things like a beak deformity. Uh, so right here you see a bird that kind of has this weird funky beak going on. And unfortunately when this happens, there's nothing we can do for the animal. Um, so we do humanely euthanize if there's nothing we can do. And then sometimes animals come in as orphans. Um, we actually get, majority of our animals are orphans. Um, so many in fact that we actually this year have taken in uh, 735 orphaned baby bunnies. So here we have some Eastern cottontail rabbits. You can tell that they are wild bunnies because a lot of wild bunnies have this little white line at the top of their heads. It's hard to see in the photo. There's little white lines, um, and that's very typical of all eastern cottontails, but they can be super tiny. Sometimes they'll come in and they're only this big. It's super cute. And then other times we get in some birds like mallards and wood ducks. Super tiny, but they were orphans. Um, so what happened to their mom is that it sounds like um, they, some of them were, the mom was hit by a car, and then some were, um, unfortunately, I think what happened to this one is the mother was separated. So they might have been crossing a busy road or mom got scared away. And unfortunately, that left them as orphans. And sometimes people like to cut down trees in the summertime. And when that happens, sometimes birds are nesting like these two cooper hawks. So these two coopers hawks were in the little nest and it fell down, but we were able to raise them up and release them back out into the wild, even though their mom was and dad were scared away. So we take in all sorts of animals, not just the one I shows, but showed, but we take everything from skunks, squirrels, we take in rabbits, we take in fox, uh, we've taken in opossum, which are really cool, uh, flying squirrels, toads, snakes, pretty much any wild animal that you find outside. We don't take in a couple of animals, though. We don't take in deer. We don't take in coyote, mainly because they're just too big and the state of Ohio says we're not allowed to take care of them. We choose not to take in raccoon because we already this year have taken in 2,975 animals and we get about 30 to 40 raccoon calls a day. So there's no way we would be able to keep up with all the sick raccoons and orphan raccoons that need our help, unfortunately. Um, and then uh, we also do not take in any domestic animals. So if you see a cat running around outside, that's not an animal that we would take in. So cats can go to the Humane Society or can even go in your house if your parents say that you're allowed to have a cat from the street. Um, but uh, they are not actually wild animals. They're called feral animals. And feral animals are animals that uh, have escaped from humans or people have willingly let them go. So unfortunately, um, they're not an animal that's actually wild, so we would not take them in. Um, same thing with like chickens and uh, uh, somebody tried to give us a chicken before and some domestic ducks and then uh, they refused they were very upset that we wouldn't take in their domestic animals, so they just released them outside. And so then we had to go chasing around a chicken for a while, which took a couple hours. Eventually we did catch him um, and we sent him to a nice home or a nice farm to live on, um, but he wasn't an animal that should have been living here. So that's a little bit about nature's a nursery. Um, we actually, 
uh, started 30, 30 years ago, um, and we only took in 100 animals. To go from 100 to last year was our busiest year, to go from 100 to 3,193, um, that's pretty incredible. And a lot of our, a lot of the ways we are even able to help all of those animals are because we have volunteers that are helping us. And people like you guys who come to programs that allow us to help care for the animals too. So the money from these programs actually goes to caring for the wildlife that we have here at the center. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about fairy tales and myths. So a lot of animals are, I'm trying to think of a good word for it. They are scary to some people. And that's because of some fairy tales and myths that hang around. Have you ever heard of the big bad wolf? So a lot of people are afraid of wolves. They think that if they go into the wolves or into the woods, a wolf might come around and sneak up on them. And that's just not true. So today we're gonna to talk about three ambassadors that we have. And let me try to find the right paper really quick. And this one is actually one that is pretty common that you can find right here in your backyard. You can find them um, at most parks, ponds that you go to. They're actually fairly common animals. They're around a lot. So I'm gonna get him to move here really quick. So we actually have him here in a pillowcase um, inside of a critter keeper, which is basically a little plastic tub. And that's so it's dark because this particular animal is nocturnal which means that they come out at night. <laughs> and you can't see him, but he's in here. So let me get him out really quick. And the reason you can't see him is actually because he likes to hide and burrow in dirt. So give me one second to get him out. These critter keepers are kind of tough to open sometimes. And I'm going to wear some gloves, not because he can make me sick, because I can make him sick, because this particular animal can actually breathe through his skin and takes up toxins, especially in water, through his skin. So anything that might be on my hands, like even hand sanitizer, can make him very, very sick. So I put on gloves and then I take a water bottle because also he likes being moist and I spray my gloves with some water and then I gotta dig him out of the dirt. Hi buddy. We'll see how long he likes to be in my hands. So here we have a toad. He's actually one of our newest ambassadors and he doesn't even have a name yet which is how new he is. So what happened with him is that he was somebody's pet. So they took him out of the wild and decided to keep him as a pet, but they didn't realize toads can live up to 15 years. And so after five years, they're like, you wanna know what? We don't want him anymore. And so we're just gonna release him into the wild. But that's a bad thing because he doesn't know how to be a wild frog or a wild toad. What he expects is a cricket to walk on by um, every single day and he has a chance to eat it. Where in the wild, he won't ever have that chance. He has to actually look for his food. He has to find a place to sleep. He has to find a place to burrow and sleep through the winter. He has to learn how to hibernate. Those are all things that he's not had to do in five years because he doesn't live in the wild. He never has. And so if these people decided to take him and put him in the wild, he would actually probably pass away pretty quick either from getting eaten by an animal or even um, maybe just not being able to find enough food so I might starve. That's definitely not a good thing. So we took him and his two sisters and they have lived with us for the past couple of weeks while we check them out and make sure they're all okay. And so what you guys seen is actually his first program. This is the first time he's been out and about and he's actually doing pretty well. So I'm gonna put him away really quick. He's super tiny compared to the female toads. And the female toads right now, they're actually in a little box right now. They do not wanna come out at all. It was really hard to find them. And so 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the myths of toads before I bring him back out again. Oh, he just buried himself back in the dirt. That's cute. So they actually use their back legs to dig in the dirt. So sometimes um, when we have ambassador toads, we have ambassadors because they cannot actually use their back legs because maybe if somebody had a weed whacker and unfortunately hurt their foot and we had to amputate it. So that means we had to cut off their foot, um, which means we can't release them in the wild because they need their back foot in order to dig into the soil. So this picture might be kind of hard to see, but right here you see their legs. So this is the back foot right here that they use to dig down deep into the soil. And that way they are able to keep themselves warm or cool depending on the season, moist too. You can't let their skin dry out um, because they do breathe through it from it. So it has to be nice and moist. And then, so there are some myths. A lot of times when people take toads, um, moms especially, might say, don't touch that toad, he'll give you warts. And that's not true. Toads will not give you warts. They may have warts on them. So I pointed right here, circled a couple of them, pointed to those warts, and it's not true. If you touch a toad and it has warts, you're not going to get them. And that myth mainly came around because there's something else on toads that can make you very sick if you touch it. It's called a bufotoxin, and that's a really fun word. Um, but this bufotoxin, if you squeeze right behind the toad's head, there's a wart there. Kind of looks like a wart, um, but it has a special uh, mucus inside of those pores. And if you press on them, it'll come out. And the reason why you can't touch it is because if you get it on your hands and accidentally touch your face or your mouth, it can make you very sick and your mom doesn't want that happening. And so that's why they say not to touch the toads. It's not actually because the toad will give you warts, but it's because the toad has something on it that could make you very sick. Does that mean you should never pick up a toad? No, just don't squeeze them too tight and you'll be fine. If you squeeze them, then that mucus will come out. We don't want that happening. And then, so toads throughout the oh, history have had a lot of kind of a bad reputation. A lot of the animals, actually I think all of them that I have today, have a bad reputation for some reason or another. But with toads, it actually, in the past, people believed that they were witches and that the witches will turn into toads and come to your house and cast a spell on you. That's not actually what toads do, but that's what people used to believe. Or they thought it was the familiar of the toad or familiar of the witch. So kind of like in Harry Potter, how Harry has an owl or Hermione has a cat and Neville has the toad. So a lot of people believe that maybe that toad that you saw hopping around was actually a witch's pet. And so you had to be very nice to that pet or it will go and tell the witch that you were being mean to it. And they also think that toads, if they were around, something bad might happen to you. Now that's not actually true. But people believe that for some reason. It was called a superstition. And then in, oddly enough, in other parts of the world, so some parts of the world, toads were bad. But then you go to the next state over or the next uh, country over, and all of a sudden, toads are good. Good toads are believed to be good in some countries. They think that um, actually if you take a toad and you touch it, and it gives you warts, right? supposedly. Well, they also believed in the past that if you took another toad and rubbed that live toad on your wart, your wart would go away. <laughs> and that's just silly. That wouldn't actually happen, just like they wouldn't actually give you warts. They also believed that if you carried a dried out toad, so here we have a toad that's dried out. They believe that if you carried that around in your pocket, it'll prevent you from getting sick. Now, that's not true at all either. 
And it's kind of silly to have think that some people in the past did used to walk around with toads in their pockets, thinking that those toads would keep them from getting sick. It's so silly to us nowadays, but back then people didn't think it was so silly. And then they even went as far, there was a story that said that toads on the top of their head had a jewel in it. And so if you took out that toad stone and put it in a ring, it would actually protect you from getting sick as well. It had magical properties that would alert you. So um, kind of like how an alarm might alert you, like a fire alarm, that there's a fire. Um, the stone would alert you that there's poison in the food that you're eating. And that's not true. It would be cool if it was, but no, that's not actually going to happen. And so there was this huge thing going around where people would actually make toadstones and sell them to people who actually thought that these toadstones were helping them keep from getting sick. And I have a picture of a toadstone right here. So do you see, I'll try to keep it still. So if you see those circles, those are the toadstones. Actually what they really are are teeth. So if you've ever seen a manta ray or a ray fish, these are actually their teeth. So the toadstones that people were finding and putting inside of rings and amulets and jewelry was actually just teeth from a stingray that lived around the time of the dinosaurs, so in the Jurassic period. And they wore these stones to protect themselves from getting poisoned. Now, if we think about it today, that's kind of silly. But back then, people believed the craziest things. So I'm gonna bring out our toad friend one more time and tell you a little bit more about toads and where they live in around here. Let me come out one more time. Hi, buddy. Oh, he's actually ready to come out right now. Got to keep a good hold on him. But there you can actually see him breathing. Maybe. I don't know how clear your screen is. But so this is a boy toad. And so he'll actually make a loud noise to call for his mates. And you usually hear it around springtime, so around May. In June, it kind of ends towards the middle of June. Sometimes you can still hear them. But this nose noise is a loud trilling noise. And that's the sound this boy will make. And in the wild, they get eaten by lots of different animals, anything that can really put them in their mouths. But remember that bufo toxin, that fun word there? That toxin will help them from getting eaten because an animal will taste that toxin like a fox or a dog, and it'll make them very, very sick. And so as soon as they taste it, it doesn't taste very good either. So as soon as they taste it, they'll drop the toad. And that's how toads protect themselves in the wild. Also, if he was in the dirt, he looks pretty dirty, right? He blends right in. And sometimes even here at Nature's Nursery, we have trouble finding him in his tank because he blends in so well. And if you notice his eyes, there's, do you see them there? They're very dark. And that helps him blend in too. If he had really bright eyes, other predators might be able to see him. And that wouldn't be good either. But they do like to live in swamps. They do like to live in forests. They'll sometimes they'll even live right in your backyard. So toads are really cool because they don't have to live near water. And they do because that's where their tadpoles live. And when they lay their eggs, their eggs have to be in water. But for the most part, toads have a better, thicker skin than frogs do. And so they can actually hop around on dry land. So you might find one in your backyard in the middle of the city, especially if somebody has a pond, because then they might go to the pond during springtime and then they might live elsewhere during the rest of the year. All right, so I'm gonna put him away. 
Maybe you can think of some names for him. So we have one boy and two girls. And I gotta put his cover back on because remember he's nocturnal, so he likes to be in the dark. All right, I'm gonna put him safely up here on the table. All right. So this next animal that I have, a lot, a lot of people are afraid of. And sometimes it makes people very nervous just to be in the same room as this one. Like my dad, unfortunately, he is terrified of this particular animal. And even if maybe I'll bring her upstairs because I have one at home. Maybe if I bring her upstairs sometimes and I'm showing her to my younger siblings, if he even sees her, he'll jump and run into a different room. He does not like them at all. Me, they're my favorite animal. I love this particular one. And they have something called a shed. So the animal I'm gonna bring out next is a snake. And before I bring her out, I wanna show you the shed here. So snakes shed their skin to get longer and to get bigger because their skin Unlike ours, our skin is kind of stretchy. So if you pinch your skin and pull it up a little bit, it stretches. A snake skin does not stretch. And so in order for them to get bigger, they have to shed their old skin and grow new skin underneath. So right here, maybe you guys can see it, I'm not sure. You can see right there, there is a circle. That's called an eye cap. So that is where the scale covers her eyes. Because when I bring her out, you'll notice she can't blink. She doesn't have eyelids like we do. And so in order to protect her eyes from getting dirty or getting scratched, those eye caps are super important. And then you have the long snake. Still going. And then her tail. So her tail does, she does have a tail. She's not just all tail. And it might be kind of hard to see on here. I don't know if I'll even be able to find it, honestly. Her tail is probably that long. And if I stood up, if you could see my whole body, the snake shed actually goes from the top of my head to the floor. So I'm five foot seven. So that's five feet, seven inches. And she's longer than I am tall, which is pretty incredible. Because when I hold her, she doesn't seem that big. So I keep her in a tote. She also is a nocturnal animal, so she does like it dark. And then I keep her in a pillowcase. Because if I didn't keep her in the pillowcase, she's actually very good at escaping. Because snakes, don't like to be stuck in places. So they are very good at getting out of sticky situations. Hello. Oh, I think I woke her up. Hi there. All right, so here she is. This is Sage. And Sage, I'm gonna actually stand up a little bit, it might be easier to hold her. Sage is a gray rat snake. And she is with us because she actually hatched in captivity at Back to the Wild, which is another nature center um, in Eastern Toledo, or Eastern Toledo, Eastern Ohio. And they didn't have room for her. So she was actually taken to the parks, the state parks, and she went on tour around the state of Ohio for a while, but they didn't have a place to keep her because snakes like to be warm. And unfortunately, during winter time, they didn't have a place warm to keep her. So we kept her during winter and took her on programs. And then the state parks took her during the summer until eventually we just kept her year round. We had her all the time. 
And so she's actually lived with us for 13 years. So <laughs> just checking you guys out. That's silly. I wonder if she can see herself. <laughs> That's funny. So you see her tongue sticking out? I'll talk about that really quick. So she's actually smelling. So she uses her tongue and it's forked, like my fingers are right now, forked. And then one part of her tongue can smell an old smell and this one can smell a new smell. And so she can actually follow a trail by a mouse. <laughs> so snakes have a bad reputation as well. A lot of people are afraid of them because they think they're poisonous. All snakes are poisonous, right? That's not true. So snakes, there's only one poisonous snake as far as I'm aware, and it's called a Bushmaster, and it lives in Africa or South America, not even in North America at all. And the Bushmaster is poisonous. So if you eat it, it makes you sick. What a lot of people get confused by are snakes that are venomous. So a venomous snake also will make somebody sick, and that's if the venomous snake bites you. Now, I would not be holding a venomous snake at all. I would not want to get bit because then I would have to go to the doctor. And the good thing about living in Ohio, especially Northwest Ohio, that there are really no venomous snakes around here. The only venomous snake is called an Eastern Massasaga rattlesnake. And people were so afraid of them that they actually kind of killed them all. So they went extinct in, or ex, they were extirpated. That's a fun word. So extirpated means that they used to live here, but no longer do. Like wolves, wolves used to live here, but you don't see a wolf running around anymore. That's because they were extirpated. But if you go to the Western part of the United States, there are wolves that still live in the wild. So, if you go to Michigan, you can find an Eastern Massasaga rattlesnake, but you can't find one around here anymore. They just don't exist because people were so afraid of them. But look at her, I'm moving her around. She's never bit anybody. You might hear her letting out air. She's not actually hissing. Um, but if you notice the top of her nose there is black. It's not supposed to be black. So she actually has trouble breathing. So if you hear a hissing noise, it's not her hissing, it's her releasing air just because she has trouble breathing. So a lot of people also think that snakes will chase you when they're, when they're trying, when you come across one. And that's not true either. So snakes wanna find the easiest way to escape. And to do that, <laughs> it might be right behind your feet. You know, there might be some place for them to hide. So that's where they're going to go. They're not actually trying to chase you. And then snakes are all throughout mythology. So you know, if you guys are religious at all, you might've heard of the story of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve um, ate the forbidden fruit. And the snake was the trickster that convinced Eve to eat that sacred fruit that God told her not to eat. You might have heard of St. Patrick, who drove all of the snakes from Ireland into the sea. So if you go to Ireland, there are no snakes on that island. It's not because St. Patrick drove them into the sea, though. It's because it was an island and it broke off, so no snakes can slither through water that far to get there. You might have heard of the Gorgons that, um, let's see, I, forget, I don't quite remember the story, uh, but Medusa, who has hair that's made out of snakes, she was cursed by Athena, who comes up actually for our next animal. Athena is the goddess of wisdom, and she cursed Medusa to have a head full of snakes. So snakes are found all throughout history and all throughout legends and folk tales and myths. A lot of people actually use snakes or snake symbolism in quite a bit of things. So right here we have, 
have more pictures. It's kind of hard to hold a snake and do this at the same time. So I'm going to put Sage away really quick, actually. So goodbye. <laughs> I'm going to stick you in here, okay? So she, I'm going to put her back actually into her tote where she feels nice and safe and warm. So she goes right back into her pillowcase. And actually, I have to use a hair tie to keep the pillowcase closed because, like I said, remember, they are great escape artists. And Sage is too. She is very good at escaping her pillowcase. All right. I'm not sure where my hair tie went. I'll just tie it up into a knot. Also, people think that snakes can dislocate their jaw, and that's what makes their mouths big, but that's not true either. So what snakes do, they actually have a stretchy jaw. Isn't that silly, a stretchy jaw? It'd be kind of cool if we could have a stretchy jaw. But what they do is they stretch their jaws as big as they can. That way they can swallow a mouse or a rat whole. That's what Sage likes to eat. She likes to eat mice and rats or chipmunks. Sometimes snakes like her will even eat birds. So like bird eggs they might find. Which can be bad because sometimes, especially on golf courses, they might mistake a golf ball for an egg. And that is not good for them at all because they can't digest it. So they end up getting very, very sick. There's my hair tie. Found it. All right. So snake symbols. So this one right here, you might recognize these two. And these are actually symbols for a medical place. So like the World Health Organization, who you might heard of um, recently, has this symbol here. And this is the symbol of medical places, the true symbol. It's for, uh, it's the rod of, Oh, I can't see the name. Asclepius. That's the best way I can say it. If anybody else can say it better, please do. Um, but so that rod is actually the rod to help heal people. This is also seen, especially around here, in a lot of medical places, especially in Western culture, that this means that there's a medical facility nearby. But the truth is, is this actually doesn't mean anything medical at all. So this is the staff of Hermes, and Hermes is the mess, a messenger. He has nothing to do with healing at all. But a lot of people got this and this symbol mixed up. So in North America, you might see this one, but it, it doesn't mean anything medical. It's actually supposed to be this one. And then over here, we have Ouroboros. That's a fun word to say. And basically, it's of a snake eating its own tail. And what it means is life, death, and rebirth. So it's a circle. It never ends. Maybe you've heard of the circle of life. It's very similar to that. And then in the United States, we have a flag here. It's called the uh, oh, Gad, Gad, Gadsen, Gadsen flag. And it says, don't tread on me. And that's actually the first flag that was flown on a warship um, in 1775 when the colonies wanted to become independent from Britain. So you may have heard of the 13 colonies and how they had a war with Britain to become free and independent. And this was the flag that they flow or had flown on warships to try to tell the British that you can't walk all over us. And they used a picture of a rattlesnake to say that if you do walk on us, be prepared. And then there's this one. This is also from uh, the, actually the French and Indian War. So that I believe the French and Indian War happened a little bit before um, the independence um, from Britain. And this, join or die symbol is all of the colonies. You see that? 
Each one has a letter next to it. And what this flag was supposed to represent, um, actually it was created by Benjamin Franklin. And this flag tells people that we need to join together. Because in the past, people believed that if you cut a snake into multiple pieces, that if you put them together, the snake would actually come back to life. And so that's what he used in his flag to tell the colonies, we need to join together to help us fight this war. And if we don't, we might die. So that was the reason behind this flag. And you see those flags still today, just like you still see the medical symbols still today. And then the last animal that I have today, it's an animal that everybody really likes and loves today, but in the past, not as much. I'm trying to find my, oh, it's right under it. All right, so here we go. Ever heard of owls? So owls are found all throughout history. And unfortunately, they're, in the past, they were considered a bad thing to have around. Um, and because of that, a lot of owls were hurt by people. And some of the reasoning was because in Native American culture, they thought that owls were symbols of death, that something bad was gonna happen, they were evil. And if they were around, they were gonna be very destructive. Now think about owls today, that's not really true. Actually, owls are really good to have around because they hunt a lot of pests that we don't like, like rodents. So like mice and rats that we have, owls love to eat those. And so they're actually really good animals to have around. They also, you might have seen it in Harry Potter where the owls come and drop off letters. So owls are actually considered messengers in the past. So they, people believed again that they were messengers of death. And that if you saw an owl around, they were sending you a message that somebody was not going to be alive much longer. That's where this picture comes in handy too. So there's a lot of, lot of folklore of bad things about owls. And unfortunately that superstition was still alive today in the United States because when pioneers would cross the rivers and go into the Great Black Swamp, which is kind of in middle of, of Ohio, the Great Black Swamp, they go through that and then they come to this big area with wide open fields. But guess what like to live there? Barn owls, owls, barn owls. And it scared people. They thought because those owls were there that something bad was gonna happen to them and their family. But that wasn't true. Those owls were there hunting mice and were actually good to have around because those farmers would plant crops that the mice loved to eat. So if you didn't have owls to eat those mice, you'd lose more food to the mice. But not all owl stories were bad. Remember how I was talking about Athena, the goddess of wisdom? So Athena, found a picture of her online right here. Athena is actually the goddess of wisdom and her, kind of like her familiar, is an owl. So whenever you see uh, Athena, you usually see her with an owl, it's either sitting on her shoulder or some flying somewhere in the background. And that's because the owl was supposed to whisper the full truth in Athena's ear. So that's what helped Athena stay very smart and wise, was that owl that was around her. In some other ways, the owls um, helped people where they were a sign of being uh, protected. So in some Native American cultures, they thought that an owl that flew over a battlefield, oh, sorry, that was the wrong one. Um, but they were a symbol of protection. So if there was an owl sitting in the tree nearby, you were being protected. There was somebody there watching over you. In Greek culture, if an owl flew over a battlefield, it was a sign that you were going to win. That there was victory nearby. And 
So I actually have an owl here today, but I want to show you some other things first. So here we have an owl wing. So this is an eastern screech owl wing. Super tiny, right? It's only the size of my hand, pretty much. And eastern screech owls, they are two colors. So you can have a gray one that lives by or a red one, or it's kind of brownish looking. So gray or red, and they're only the size of my hands. But then there are also great horned owls. So here's that wing. Remember this one as big as my hand? Here's this one. It's probably as big as my arm. And those owls live around here too. So these owls like tiny trees. You could find a screech owl right in your backyard. But a great horned owl, you can't find one in your backyard unless you have really big trees and a forest behind your house. But a cool thing I want to show you, and I don't know if it's going to show up on the screen, is right here. So these are real owl wings. So what I'm going to show you is an actual owl bone. And let me see. don't know if you can see it. But I'll try to keep it steady. So right there, you can actually see the bone is hollow. And there are holes in it. And that's what makes owls so light. So this big great horned owl wing that I'm holding, this owl only weighs three pounds. This wing is lighter than a sheet of paper. In fact, if I hold it in my hand, it barely feels like there's anything in my hand at all. So imagine how this one feels. This one feels almost weightless. And then here is an Eastern screech owl foot. You see how tiny it is? Super small. And so it's only the size of my finger. Super tiny. This owl can actually sit on my finger if it wanted to. And then there's this one. So this one, I guess it could also sit on my finger if it wanted to, but one of its toes is as long as my finger. It's kind of hard to see with the talons. Maybe if I go against the white, see? It's as long as my finger is. Here's the screech owl foot, super tiny. It's as long as the great horned owl foot, toe. That's it. You see how big that is? It's huge. Can you imagine one of these coming towards your face? That's terrifying. So a lot of people in the past might've been pretty scared of owls, but really there's nothing to be afraid of. Owls are pretty nice to have around. And I have an owl friend with me today. I'll bring her out in one second. Let me grab my glove. Can't find my glove. So we'll wear this glove. So the reason I wear this glove is so that her finger or her talons do not go into my skin. It always said go into the glove. And I'm giving me one second to get her out. She can sometimes be a little stubborn. Good. Oh, she's having a little trouble. Give her one second. <laughs> she doesn't want to come out, silly girl. All right, we'll try one more time. Did you hear it clacking at me? Oops, and I probably need to grab, grab this just in case she poop, she's not pooping on my computer. <laughs> so here is Serafina. She is an Eastern Screech Owl, and she's going to do everything she can to not look at you guys. Oh, there you go. And then she looked for a second. So Serafina has been with us for about 10 years now. And she's a fully grown adult owl, but you see how tiny she is? She can fit right here on the computer screen, no problem. And 
That's because she's an eastern screech owl. She's only the size of my hand. See, super tiny. And she's with us because the side facing you is actually the side where she's missing her wing. So she was found in a train yard and she was found uh, right next to some railroad tracks. So what we think happened is that a uh, train may have come by and maybe hit her, unfortunately, and took her wing. Now, luckily, nothing else was hurt. It was just her wing that was gone. And so we were able to save her. But unfortunately, if an owl can't fly, we can't release them into the wild because they don't know how to hunt, or they won't. They may know how to hunt, but they might not be able to. And so that's why we have her. And she could be eight years old, which is, or 10 years old, which is how long we've had her. She can be 15, she could be up to 25 years old. And that's because we don't know how old she was when she came to us. She was already an adult. And she's been with us her entire life. Well, for a long time now, haven't you? <laughs> and there you go. Do you see those ear tufts at the top of her head? So you might see them, they're right here, right there. Those ear tufts are not actually ears, they're just feathers that are on the top of her head to show you or to show other animals that she's just a broken tree branch. So in the wild, they want to camouflage themselves. And in order to be camouflaged, they will actually pretend they're broken tree branches. So when she's scared, she'll bring all of her feathers really close and tight together, have her ears sticking straight up or her ear tufts, which are just feathers, sticking straight up into the air. And that way she actually looks like a tree branch. And that way her predator, which is those big owls, those great horned owls, don't actually see her. <laughs> She's sitting a little funky on my hand. She's like sitting like a little chicken almost. And then you see those big eyes. So her eyes are super, super big. And that's so she can see at night. So she can see at night, unlike us. So if we're outside and we put our hand in front of our face, we might not be able to see our hand if it's so dark. But her, if there's a star in the sky, she can see everything still. That's how good their eyes are. They are the great, or probably the best hunters owls are. And owls, a lot of people think owls can turn their heads all the way around in a circle, and that's not true. Owls can turn their heads 270 degrees to 290 degrees. So what that means is they can look right, they can look left, and then they can keep going and look right behind them. But if you guys try that, can you guys try looking right, left, and then moving your head and looking right behind you? But the trick is you can't move your shoulders. So if you try that, can you do it? I can't. I can barely turn my head 180 degrees, which is just looking right and looking left. But they want to be able to look behind them. Let me see if she'll, <laughs> she's not going to let me do it. But if she let me turn her around, you would see that she could actually look at, over her back right at us. And that's so if there's a predator nearby, she can keep her eye on the predator but without having to move. So she won't make any noise. Or maybe think of prey. If the tree branch, if there's a tree branch and it's going up and down, it might be hard for her to see, right? So she's gonna keep her head still, even though the rest of her body is going up and down. And that's so she can track her food all around so she can find her prey. And then there's one last thing I want to show you about her. Hi, yes. <laughs> I'm just getting owl pellets. See? That's all. So right here, it might be kind of hard to see through the plastic. Maybe do a screen. Nope, that's not owl poop you're looking at. Those are owl pellets. And what that is, is actually the bones, the fur, and the feathers of what other, other ugh, sorry, the bones, the fur, the feathers, or the scales of whatever creature that they ate. So she eats mice, or that's what we feed her. 
And so her owl pellets will have the full skeleton because they eat their prey whole. They'll have the full skeleton of the mouse or rat that she ate. Or fish, sometimes we give them fish, so they'll have fish scales in the pellets, or they'll have fish bones. And that's because they can't digest it. It'll make them very sick if they decided to try to digest it. Mm -hmm. There we go, now we can see her, she's turning her head around. So her back's towards you. Well, no, her back was towards me, sorry. Serafina, you look over here. No, she's not gonna do it. She's just glaring at me. <laughs> she's not happy to be out at all, silly girl. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed the program today. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask your librarians or your parents. They are super intelligent. They also know how to use Google and Google can be handy. And just remember, snakes don't actually chase you. Owls aren't evil. And if you lick a toad, you might get sick, but they won't give you warts. Thank you. I think those are some good words to live by. <laughs> I know I've learned a lot and I hope everyone else did. Thank you again, Jamie and Nature's Nursery for coming and actually doing this virtual program with us since we couldn't be in person. And where can everybody find you guys at? On social media? Yep, so we have a lot of things on Facebook uh, with so many photos of animals. We give you updates about what's going on daily at the center. Um, we are on YouTube. So we do have some of our own videos. If you look up Nature's Nursery, um, or it's actually Laura JPZ, um, we have a lot of Nature's Nursery videos on those two accounts. Um, and if you contact us, whoops, I moved too quick. <laughs> um, if you look us up on uh, just the basic website, we have all sorts of fun things on there too, about how to volunteer or to schedule in the program if you'd like, because I've gone to Boy Scout troops, Girl Scout troops. Um, right now I'm doing a lot of private programs. So um, there's this cool lady who's doing a book club um, for her neighborhood kids. So she every week, she every Friday or something, she's having all the kids in the neighborhood come to her house and they're all socially distant and she reads a book to them. And she's having us, the book is, um, I forget the book name, but it's about rabbits and there's a raptor in it. And so she's having us come out um, on the last book club day uh, to do something nice for the kids in the neighborhood. It's really cute. Oh, that's so awesome. What a great idea. Well, and with that, I'm going to stop courting then.